Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Set Coffee Talk. Our guest today is someone you've been clamouring for since he was pegged to take over as Singapore's new PM. But first, a quick update on Greg. Remember Greg, the spiritual healer we interviewed a few episodes back? It turns out he was arrested for stealing undergarments, the ladies' kind, from the common corridors of several HDB blocks in the north. But it wasn't to satiate his depraved tendencies. He was repurposing them into face masks, which he then distributed to the needy for free. Considering the circumstances, I have to say, bravo Greg, I hope you get off the hook. Alright, without further ado, let's bring on my esteemed guest, Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Singapore, Mr. Hing Sui Kiat. Thank you very much for all this. I hope to get Singaporeans to think about our long-term future. We all share a sense of common purpose. Now, how can we come together to think about what will Singapore be like? What do we want Singapore to be like 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And how do we uh, help our future generation to also shape their views? Excellent. I'm excited to hear your vision for the country, and so is our audience. You were the second most wanted guest on our polls, just behind Sheng the Rapper. I'm so happy. Before we get into it, I have to ask, this is the first time that an incumbent cabinet minister has agreed to speak candidly on an independent podcast. Why this change of heart from the big G? We know it's not because of our listener numbers. <laughs> well, uh, Steve, I, th I think that's a very important question. That's not my name, but go on. As long as your heart is for the good of Singapore and Singaporeans, we'll work with anyone to better understand the hopes and aspirations and the concerns of our people. Fair enough, fair enough. Although I hope you know I'm not exactly known for being a paragon for the ruling class. I think you, you, you are a good illustration of how you know, each of us can play our part. And you, in fact, you have contributed in many, many areas. Oh, thank you. It's nice to be acknowledged by someone other than my mother. So, let's kick things off light. Climate change. As we all know, the warming of the planet is causing a chain reaction that could very well devastate countless human lives and disrupt ecosystems. What is the government doing to show that it is taking this global threat seriously? Indeed, I share your concerns about climate change. Because with climate change, global sea temperature rises, and if it goes by a certain amount, the whole ecosystem can be destroyed. And so it's important for us to take action. So what is it that Singapore can do? Uh, as you know, I've announced a carbon tax in order that we do our part uh, in keeping to our Paris Agreement, and we work with like-minded people, so that's first. Uh, second, we are doing a lot of uh, R&D work on urban solutions and sustainability. Nice. Sounds like there's quite a lot in the pipeline. While we're on the topic of the environment and nature, what do you think has been Singapore's greatest contribution to her natural environment? So I would say that overhead bridge across uh, PI, PIE, uh, where it allows the animals to cross from one part to another. Sweet. So we've built physical bridges for animals. What about the metaphorical bridges connecting us to the rest of the world? Do you think Singapore should play a more active role on the global stage to try to influence geopolitical matters that would favour us? Or should we carry on as usual and try to avoid conflict as much as possible? Uh, this is a good question. I, I don't have a simple solution, but I say we should stay neutral for as, as, as far as possible. Actually, Singaporeans are very, we are very fortunate to grow up and live in a multi-racial, multi-religious, multi-cultural organizations. And that we, have, we should have the ability to connect with all parts of the world and be friends with everyone in the world. Hmm. Do you think so? Most people would argue that to connect peacefully and productively with others, one needs to develop a tolerance or better yet, an appreciation for different viewpoints rather than simply a tolerance for what someone looks like, prays to, or eats, which is essentially the skin-deep level of diversity found here. No, I'm not saying that we have no room to improve. There will always be room to improve. But more importantly, to take a more proactive step 
to keep emphasizing the value of our multiracial, multi religious, uh, multicultural uh, um, setting. In fact, last night, um, SM uh, Teochi Hien uh, and I were at the event for the uh, Hare Raya uh, dinner uh, with uh, Minister Masagos. And it was a wonderful event. I, I met many members of the interreligious organizations, and it was, it was a very multiracial uh, event. The f two weeks back, two, three weeks back, I was in uh, Gelang Sarai with uh, SMS Maliki. And it was such a vibrant place, both a traditional Hari Raya Bazaar as well as a new section with plenty of hipster cafe. So for the first time, I understood what a hipster cafe was about. But what was most interesting was, for me was to see so many young people you know, having a good time together, eating, and so many new and interesting uh, halal food uh, being sold. And everyone was having a good time. I think you just described how normal people behave at official dinners. And was the Gelang Sarai stuff about racial harmony? I'm just a bit lost because it seems to be about different generations of the same community sharing the same commercial space. We shouldn't expect resistance, am I wrong? Uh, I'm curious, DPM, does anyone vet your stories? I can help you craft better ones. They'll be way more heartfelt and relevant. We'll talk after the show. We'll discuss further and I look forward to your, your inputs on this. Great. Alright, so it's been a while since you left your post as Education Minister, but I'm sure your head is still bubbling with all kinds of bold, creative ideas on how to improve education. Would you like to share one or two of those ideas with us? Do you think it would be a good idea if a primary 5 student were to help, say, a primary 2 student to read. No. You're all in the same school, you don't have to go and spend time and nope. resources to go from point A to point B, but every day, just 10 minutes from your school, no. you just during recess time, uh, you no. just take 10 minutes to read to them. I shouldn't help have asked. Them. Why? I mean, where to begin? Considering how stressful our education system is, don't you think that P5 student has enough on her plate? Why should she have to shoulder this extra burden? And what happens if that younger student doesn't see any improvement? Are we subjecting that P5 student to unnecessary turmoil? Oh, okay. Just a thought. But I do like the idea of letting kids take more ownership of their development. Indeed. Let's move on to something that we're all concerned with today. And that's the spread of fake news. How does the government intend to fight this other than through the use of POFMA? Online media is something that we have to guard very carefully. At the end of the day, the best safeguard for democracy are you know, well-informed citizens. Agreed. Agreed. There's a lot of um, uh, effort to help our school children learn about you know, what to trust and what not to trust. And uh, in particular, with the social media, with the internet, I think it's a village to raise a child. So all of us have a role whether as parents, as teachers uh, in the community, to help our young people to be able to uh, discern the truth uh, from the fake news. Sounds good in theory, but I'm less concerned with kids getting duped because they have limited influence. I'm more worried that adults are being taken in by and acting on fake news. So if adults lack the tools to discern real and fake, how can we expect the village to raise the child, to use your analogy. This is a learning process on both sides. You mentioned about POFMA. POFMA is also another very important safeguard in our law that we can debate and we can have different opinions, but different opinions must be based on facts, on truth. If you and I differ even on the basic facts, we have no basis for debating an issue, and that will be quite, not only unproductive, but potentially destructive. I have to disagree there. An opinion by its very nature is subjective. There are no facts supporting my opinion that the best ice cream flavour is pistachio, right? 
Look, I hear what you're saying. We should all make our arguments using accurate data. But we both know there's a clear imbalance of data distribution between the government and the rest of the population. One side is privy to way more information than the other. So if the side with less information continually faces criminal charges for speculating, inferring, or being vague, then the government will win every argument. In that situation, why solicit ideas or opinions from the people anymore? The government should just do everything unilaterally. I, I guess it kind of already is doing that, which proves my point, I think. So I see this as an evolving process. Nothing's, nothing can succeed at the first try. Right? Very, few peop- very few things can succeed at the, on the first try. Oh yeah? Then why am I paying child support? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> and interestingly, you mentioned that you are digital uh, literacy, uh, you're doing work on digital literacy. And that is one very important area for us to work on. Because uh, how many of us have so often been to restaurants and you see a whole family gathering there eating, but everyone on their mobile phone <laughs> instead of having a nice meal and having a family time. So those are things that we have to watch out for. That's an unfortunate trend, but I'm not sure how it's related to digital literacy. Okay. Anyway, I want to touch on immigration and emigration. Singapore's foreign population at the end of 2019 stood at a sizable 39%. And a recent IPS survey found that 1 in 5 Singaporeans want to leave the country. Are you worried that these two trends working in tandem are making it harder to develop a strong national identity that can rally the population in tough times. Assuming that the government still thinks that a strong Singaporean identity is something worth striving for. Recently, I was in Silicon Valley, spoke to about three, four hundred Singaporeans and Southeast Asians who were in Silicon Valley, and I asked them, uh, are you going to come back? The one thing which touched me a great deal was many of them said, you know, it was great that I was, I'm in Silicon Valley learning all sorts of things, but Singapore is still home, dad and mom are still home, I would like to go back. And uh, I think creating that bond is, is very important in the very, at the outset. Man, these stories are not doing it for me. These overseas Singaporeans are not saying anything about their feelings for Singapore. They are literally just talking about missing the people they love. Have you tried to ask them what part of Singapore they miss? The lifestyle, the weather, the people, the buildings, the politics, the rules. Have you asked them if they still want to return, if their parents are willing to move to them? I think we must create opportunities for our young people to feel that this is not just a place where I earn a living, but this is a place where my ties are, my families are, my friends are. Uh, recently, I met a group of Singaporeans who have been we away in China for about 20 years, making, becoming very successful. I spoke to them, and I was very happy that two of them have decided to set up their branch office in Singapore and coming back. And the main reason, dad and mum are home. Again, what's with the obsession about getting Singaporeans to come back? Your anecdotes don't take into account why these Singaporeans left in the first place, and whether they're happier away. Why not have more productive conversations about where the Singapore experience falls short and attempt to address that instead? Like, why don't we have a tech community that's just as open, disruptive, creative and vibrant as Silicon Valley? Right now, it seems like our strategy to get Singaporeans to return is to hold their parents hostage. So, uh, this is an evolving... We'll make progress along the way. Okay, we're kind of short on time. Let's move on. Singaporeans have questioned the need to raise GST instead of exploring other progressive taxes like an inheritance tax, which affects the upper class more. How do you defend this decision? No finance minister wants to increase taxes, but it it is not an easy decision for me. I took a long time to mull over it to see what is the best way that can take that can continue to keep Singapore vibrant, that can continue to keep our uh, economy vibrant, as well as meet the many needs. 
The one thing which I hope many Singaporeans will appreciate is that the biggest source of revenue for our, in our last two years for our budget is not GST, it's not personal income tax, it's not even corporate income tax. The biggest portion, anybody knows the answer? Ah, you're trying to get me to guess and then you'll pop me if I get it wrong, right? Nice try. Why don't you tell us the answer? <laughs> it's our reserve, right? NIRC, the, our net investment return contribution. Well, I'm not surprised. The government has invested a lot in foreign assets, especially in China, India and other emerging markets. It's so strange to think that the financial health of Singapore is so dependent on forces beyond our control. It makes me wonder just how valuable we are on our own, you know? What's the collective worth of our homegrown labour and exports? We have rich reserves, but are we spending enough of our returns to build a more robust economy that's driven by local IPs? Of course, of course. And I will continue to think hard about how we can generate uh, better resources for our people. That's good to hear. All right, I think we have time for one more topic. Let's go with growing old, something that concerns all of us. What are your thoughts on aging gracefully in Singapore? How can we make the twilight years of Singaporeans better, more comfortable, more fulfilling? Your, your question is actually a very critical one because, you see, our, our seniors, the, the number of people who are above 65 and above, will increase from about 450,000 today to 900,000 by 2030. And 2030 is just 11 years away. We are going to be one of the most rapidly aging uh, societies in the world. So there are people who are working on uh, the idea of a productive longevity. Uh, a few months back, I went to Japan to study what they were doing because Japan is one of the highest aging uh, rates in the world. And what Japan has done is, for instance, in the area of uh, work, they have found that people who want to work, people who work, stay healthy because there's something to look forward to every day. There's a whole circle of friends and colleagues that they can continue to interact with. It's not such a sharp uh, change of lifestyle. So uh, when this, we are looking at what can be done for us to think about retirement, retirement age, and keeping our people uh, healthy and active even as, as they grow older. Yeah, I think a number of studies support the idea that work can help the elderly for the reasons you described. But I also feel we have to be careful about making this the norm. Seniors and society as a whole might be worse off if we start creating policies around the notion that you should spend the last chapter of your life no different from your earlier years when you were saddled with debt. This is very much something that we must continue to talk about. I think a better strategy would be to strengthen our social support and healthcare systems so the basic needs of the elderly can be taken care of. That way, work becomes an avenue to stay active and social rather than a source of stress. Meanwhile, we should focus on replicating the benefits of gainful employment in a more wholesome, low-stakes environment. For example, CCs could organise more activities and classes for the elderly get them interested in sports, hobbies and interests they might have scoffed at when they were young and busy. Things like gardening, pottery, video games, water aerobics, host more competitions exclusively for seniors, so they have goals to attain. Some of these endeavours could enhance the gig economy and spawn new commercial opportunities too. I'm glad to hear that you know, there's, there's such interest in this. So I would reflect this to my colleagues for them to take a look as to what specific things we can do. I know there are steep challenges involved in supporting the ageing population, but I really think it's important that we do it and we do it well because we've been neglecting the impact of having a frail and depressed elderly population. If we can keep our elderly active and engaged, maybe the younger generation wouldn't feel bummed out by the bleak future that awaits them. Maybe then they'll feel more passionate about contributing to Singapore. This is very much a work in progress. As we make one improvement, there will always be the next step to take and the next step to take. 
and it's a continuous process. Sure, I get it. All right, DPM Ping, looks like we are out of time. This has been enlightening. I learned a lot, although I'm still not quite sure what to expect in the future. I want to thank you once again for coming down to our humble studio and talking with us. I hope I wasn't too critical, just a citizen trying to contribute in his own way. They say that too many cooks spoil the broth, but not if you're having hot pot, am I right? Up top. Ow! You have quite the slapping power. Uh, let, let me thank you for doing this very meaningful work. I live for it. Any parting words for our listeners? Every one of us, whether you are young or old, can find a practical way in which you can make a difference. Everyone can play our part to make the lives of people around us better, to make uh, Singapore uh, even better. And again, if you have specific issues uh, that you think could be improved, you're welcome to send your suggestions. Also, uh, members of public may not see it, but I can assure you that there's a lot of work going on. Beautiful. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you in the next one. Stay curious. They all look. It's unfair. But you're winning. Your hippos are eating way more marbles than mine. Now how do we make them more hungry? Huh?